This is Chapter 4 of Theosophy by Rudolf Steiner. Chapter 4 is entitled The Path to Knowledge. Each one of us is capable of coming to understand spiritual science as it is presented in this book. Explanations, such as those given here, provide an image of the higher world's in thought form. In a certain respect, since we human beings are thinking beings, these very explanations constitute a first step toward perceiving for ourselves. We can only find our own path to knowledge by taking thinking itself as our starting point. To present our understanding with an image of higher worlds is by no means fruitless, although at the immediate moment it may indeed be no more than an account of things we are not yet able to perceive for ourselves. Thoughts that have been supplied for us constitute a force that goes on working in the world of our thoughts. This force becomes active within us arousing potentials that lie dormant in us. It is a mistake to believe that we waste our time by dwelling on an image in thought form. This opinion assumes that thoughts are unreal and abstract, while in actuality they are founded on a living force. To someone who has acquired knowledge, thoughts are present as a direct expression of what is perceived in the spirit. And when this expression is communicated to a second person, it lives on in that person as a seed that will grow and bear knowledge as its fruit. Anyone who scorns strenuous mental effort as a way of acquiring higher knowledge, turning instead to other forces available to us, is not taking into account the fact that thinking is the highest of the faculties we human beings possess in the physical world. For this reason, people who ask how to acquire direct higher spiritual scientific knowledge should be told to begin by familiarizing themselves with what others have to say about it. If they insist that they want only to see for themselves, they, that they do not want to know about what other people have seen, they must be told that learning what others have to say on the subject is the first step toward acquiring knowledge for themselves. Of course they may say that meanwhile they are forced to accept things on blind faith. However, the point is not to believe or disbelieve what has been communicated, but only to be unbiased and receptive toward it. Genuine spiritual researchers never speak in the expectation that they will be met with blind faith, but say only, quote, These are my experiences in spiritual areas of existence, and I am telling you about them. Close quote. However, they also know that opening oneself to this information and imbuing one's own thoughts with it constitute active forces for spiritual development in the listener. To approach this issue correctly, we must take into account that all knowledge of the soul and spirit worlds lies dormant in each human soul and can be brought to light by traveling the path to knowledge. However, we are capable of grasping not only what we ourselves bring up from the soul's depths, but also what someone else has done in this respect. This is true even if we ourselves have not set out on the path to knowledge. Correct spiritual insight awakens the power of understanding in any mind not clouded by prejudice, and our own subconscious knowledge readily acknowledges spiritual facts discovered by others. 
This is no blind faith, but rather the natural response of common sense. What our healthy natural understanding recognizes as true when presented with the results of genuine spiritual research constitutes a much better starting point for first-hand knowledge of the spiritual world than any dubious mystical contemplations and the like, even though we often assume the opposite. We need to subject ourselves to the hard work of thinking if we want to develop our capacity for higher knowledge. Let me read that again. The need to subject ourselves to the hard work of thinking if we want to develop our capacity for higher knowledge cannot be emphasized strongly enough. This is all the more urgent because many people who want to become seers underestimate the need for this earnest and self-denying work on one's thinking. They say that thinking doesn't work for them, that everything depends on feeling or the like. These people must be told that it is impossible to become a true to become a seer in the true higher sense of the word without first working one's way into the world of thinking. A certain inner laziness plays a regrettable role in many personalities who do not become aware of it because it disguises itself as contempt for abstract thinking and for idle speculation and so on. However, we completely misunderstand thinking if we confuse it with any idle or abstract spinning of thoughts. That kind of, quote, abstract thinking, close quote, can easily kill supersensible knowledge, but living, vital thinking can become the foundation for it. Of course, it would be much more comfortable if we could avoid the strenuous work of thinking while acquiring the higher faculties of a seer, and many people would prefer to do it that way. However, only thinking can lead to the inner steadiness and stability of soul that seership requires. Without it we get nothing more than a meaningless and erratic display of images, enjoyable, perhaps, but totally irrelevant as far as actual access to the higher worlds is concerned. And if we consider the purely spiritual experiences of an individual who really enters the higher world, we will also grasp still another side of the issue. An absolutely healthy soul life is essential for a seer, and there is no better means of cultivating a healthy soul life than real thinking. In fact, people's mental health can suffer seriously if their training for higher development is not based on thinking. Becoming a seer will make any healthy right-thinking individual even healthier and more fit for life than before. But taking a dreamy approach to self-development by shunning the rigors of thinking can only foster illusions and a faulty approach to life. There is no need to worry, however, as long as what has been said here is taken into account as a prerequisite to higher development, a prerequisite that has to do exclusively with the human soul and spirit. Once this prerequisite is recognized, to talk about any possible harmful effect on a person's bodily health is absurd. Unwarranted disbelief, however, is harmful because it acts as a repelling force, preventing the recipient from taking up the fruitful influence of these thoughts. The prerequisite to opening our higher senses is not blind faith, but simply receptivity to the world of spiritual scientific thought. Spiritual researchers challenge their students not to believe what they are told, but to think it, to take it into the world of their own thoughts. By allowing it to work from within, they will come to recognize its truth on their own. 
This is the approach spiritual researchers take. They provide the incentive, but the power to perceive the truth arises within the listeners themselves. This is how spiritual scientific ideas ought to be sought. Those who have the self-discipline to immerse their thoughts in spiritual science can be sure that this will eventually lead to the ability to perceive for themselves. What has just been said already suggests one of the first qualities that must be cultivated by people who want to achieve independent perception of higher realities. It is unreserved and unbiased devotion to what human life or the world outside us has to reveal. If we approach any phenomenon with a preconceived notion derived from our life as it has been until now, we shut ourselves off from the quiet yet pervasive influence this phenomenon can have on us. While learning, we must be able at any moment to make ourselves into a totally empty vessel into which the world we do not know can flow. Moments of recognition happen only when any prejudice or criticism coming from us is silenced. For instance, it makes no difference whether we are wiser than the person we are meeting. Even a child with minimal understanding has something to disclose to the greatest sage. Approaching the child with any prejudgment at all, no matter how wise, is like looking, quote, through a glass darkly, close quote, at what the child has to reveal. Footnote. It is evident from this example that there can be no question of erasing our own judgment or submitting to blind faith. This would make no sense in reference to a child. Close. End of footnote. Complete inner selflessness is part of this devotion to what the unknown world can reveal. And we will probably make some astonishing discoveries about ourselves when we test the extent of our own devotion. If we want to set out on the path to higher knowledge, we must practice until we are able to obliterate ourselves and all our prejudices at any moment so that something else can flow into us. Only high levels of selfless devotion enable us to perceive the higher spiritual phenomena all around us. We can deliberately cultivate this faculty by trying to refrain from judging people in our surroundings. For example, we must eliminate any standards of attractiveness and unattractiveness, stupidity and cleverness that we apply as a matter of habit. We must try to understand people purely out of themselves. It is best to practice on people to whom we have an active aversion, forcibly suppressing this aversion and letting everything they do work on us without bias. Or, if we find ourselves in some circumstances that elicit a certain judgment in response, we can suppress this judgment in order to be receptive and unbiased toward any impressions that may come to us. Footnote. <clears throat> this unbiased receptivity has nothing to do with blind faith. The point is not to believe blindly in something, but rather to refrain from letting blind judgment usurp the place of a living and vital impression. End of footnote. We should allow things and events to speak to us more than we speak about them. And we should extend this principle to our thoughts as well, suppressing whatever it is in ourselves that shapes a certain thought and allowing only external things to elicit thoughts. Exercises like this can help us achieve our goal of higher knowledge only if they are carried out with persistence and in holy earnestness. Anyone who underestimates exercises of this sort is totally unaware of their value. On the other hand, anyone experienced in these matters knows that devotion and absence of bias actually create strength. 
just as the heat that is applied to a boiler is transformed into the force that makes a steam engine move, these exercises in selfless spiritual devotion are transformed within us into the strength to see into the spiritual worlds. By means of this exercise, we make ourselves receptive to everything around us, but receptivity is not enough. We must also be capable of properly assessing what we perceive. As long as we still tend to overvalue ourselves at the expense of the world around us, we are putting off the moment when we will gain access to higher knowledge. People who give in to the personal pleasure or pain they experience through things and events in the outer world are still caught up in valuing themselves too highly. Their personal pleasure or pain teaches them something about themselves, but nothing about the things in question. If I am sympathetically inclined toward someone, my own relationship to that person is all I can experience at first. And if I allow my judgment and my behavior to depend on my own feelings of pleasure or sympathy, I allow my own idiosyncrasies to take center stage and impose them on my surroundings. I want the world to include me just as I am, but I do not want to accept the world for what it is or to let it assert itself in accordance with the forces at work in it. In other words, I am tolerant of only what suits my own personality. I ward off anything else. And as long as we remain captives of the sense world, we are especially likely to ward off any non-sensory influences. <clears throat> as we learn, we must develop the ability to relate to things and people in their uniqueness recognizing the value and significance of each and every one. Sympathy and antipathy, pleasure and displeasure, must take on totally new roles. This is clearly not a matter of completely eradicating sympathy and antipathy and becoming totally numb to them. On the contrary, the more we cultivate our ability to refrain from responding immediately to sympathy or antipathy with a judgment or an action, the finer the sensitivity we develop. Once we can control the character that already is, excuse me, once we can control the character they already assume within us, we will experience that sympathies and antipathies assume a higher character. Even the seemingly most unappealing thing has hidden qualities that are revealed when we do not simply yield to our own selfish feelings. People who have schooled themselves in this regard are exceptionally sensitive to everything around them because they do not allow their own inclinations to make them unreceptive. Any inclination we follow blindly deadens our ability to see things around us in the right light. It makes us force our way through our environment rather than exposing ourselves to it and experiencing its inherent value. Once we no longer react selfishly to each instance of joy and pain, sympathy and antipathy, we become independent of the changing impressions we receive from the outer world. The pleasure we experience because of a particular thing immediately makes us dependent on that thing. We lose ourselves in it. We cannot travel the path to higher knowledge if we are constantly losing ourselves in either pleasure or pain as a result of the ever-changing impressions that confront us. Once we have learned to accept pleasure and pain with equanimity, we can stop losing ourselves in them and begin to understand them. As soon as I surrender to pleasure, it consumes my very existence. Instead, I should make use of pleasure only as a means of understanding pleasurable things. 
The point for me should not be the fact that something causes me pleasure. I should experience the pleasure and through it the nature of the thing itself. For me, pleasure should be nothing more than an indication that this thing possesses the ability to give pleasure, a characteristic I must learn to recognize in it. If I stop short at the pleasure itself and let myself be totally taken in by it, I am experiencing only myself. On the other hand, if pleasure gives me an opportunity to experience a characteristic of the thing itself, I enrich my inner nature through the experience. In the course of our research, pleasure and displeasure, joy and pain, must present us with opportunities to learn about things. This does not make us immune to pleasure and pain. It enables us to rise above them so that they can disclose the actual nature of external things. By cultivating this faculty, we will come to realize what good teachers pleasure and pain are. We will co-experience what each and every being feels and thus receive a revelation of its inner nature. If we are truly seeking, we never stop short at our own suffering or pleasure, but always ask what that joy or suffering has to tell us. We surrender our personal selves so that suffering or pleasure coming from the outside world can work on us. This permits us to develop a totally new way of relating to things. Whereas our reactions to specific impressions used to be based only on our own liking or disliking, we can now let pleasure and displeasure be organs through which things tell us what they themselves are in their essence. In us pleasure and pain are transformed from mere feelings into sensory organs through which we perceive the outer world. When our eyes see something, they do not take action themselves, but rather cause our hands to act. So too, when a spiritual researcher's pleasure and pain, parenthesis, to the extent that they are being applied as a means to knowledge, close parenthesis, receive impressions, they do not act directly. Only what is experienced via pleasure and displeasure then leads to action. When we make a practice of using pleasure and displeasure as organs to transmit information, they fashion the actual soul organs we need for the soul world to disclose itself to us. Our eyes can serve our physical body only by being organs of transmission for sensory impressions. Similarly, pleasure and displeasure develop into, quote, soul eyes, close quote, when they cease to assert themselves for their own sake and begin to reveal unknown souls to us. The above-mentioned faculties put us in a position to let the things and beings present in our surroundings work on us free of the disturbing influence from our own idiosyncrasies. But we must also insert ourselves into the spiritual world of which we all, as thinking beings, are citizens. This can happen in the right way only if, during the process of recognizing the Spirit, we can make our train of thought correspond to the eternal laws of truth, the laws of spirit country. This is the only way this world can work on us and reveal its phenomena to us. We will not reach the truth by simply giving ourselves up to the transient thoughts coursing through our capital I. These thoughts have their progression imposed on them in that they come into existence within our bodily nature. As long as the physical brain is conditioning our cognitive activity, our thoughts appear haphazard and confused. One thought begins and then breaks off, driven from the scene by a second thought. If we really examine a conversation between two people as we listen to it, or if we observe ourselves carefully, we will get an idea of the will-o'-the-wisp 
quality of these thoughts. As long as we are applying ourselves to tasks in the sense-perceptible world, our confused train of thought is always straightened out by the actual matter at hand. Regardless of how confused I am in my thinking, daily life forces me to conform to the laws of reality in my actions. For example, I may have an extremely haphazard idea of how a city is laid out, but if I want to get around in it, I have to adapt to how things really are. Mechanics may come into the shop with their heads full of a jumble of all kinds of ideas, but the laws governing how their machines work will compel them to adopt appropriate working procedures. In the sense-perceptible world, Hard facts act as a constant corrective to our thinking. If I have the wrong idea about some physical phenomenon, such as the form of a plant, reality confronts me and sets my thinking straight. In relationship to higher areas of existence, however, things are very different. These realms disclose themselves to me only when I approach them with my thinking already strictly disciplined. In this case, if my thinking does not provide the correct impulse, if I am not my own confident guide, I will not find the right way to go. The spiritual laws prevailing here have not condensed to the point of physical perceptibility and therefore do not impose the same corrective as sense-perceptible things do so I will be able to obey them only if they are related to my own laws, the ones that govern me as a thinking being. As a seeker of knowledge, I must alter my thinking so that it is strictly self-regulating. My thoughts must gradually get out of the habit of running their everyday course and adopt instead the inner character of the spiritual world. I must be able to observe myself in this regard and keep things under control. I must not allow one thought to follow another arbitrarily, but only in accordance with the rigorous standards of the contents of the thought world. The transition from one idea to another must correspond to strict laws of thinking, and I myself as a thinker must stand as a copy of these laws, so to speak. I must eliminate from my train of thought everything not flowing from these laws. If a favorite thought gets in my way, I must push it aside so that it does not disturb the orderly sequence. And if a personal feeling tries to impose a direction on my thoughts that is not inherent in them, I must suppress it. Plato required those applying to his school to take a course in mathematics first. Since the strict laws of mathematics are not subject to the ordinary course of sensory phenomena, they make a very good preparation for seekers of knowledge who must put aside personal arbitrariness and distractions if they wish to make progress in mathematics. Voluntarily overcoming all uncontrolled and arbitrary thinking prepares them for the task ahead. They learn to respond to only the requirements of thinking itself, since that is how they must proceed in all thought activity that serves spiritual knowledge. Their thinking must replicate the undisturbed results and conclusions of mathematics. Wherever they go, wherever they may be, they must always attempt to think in this way. Then the laws of the spiritual world, laws that pass through without a trace when thinking is of the everyday confused variety, can flow into them. Well-ordered thinking leads them from secure starting points to the most hidden truths. These suggestions should not be taken one-sidedly, however. Although mathematics is good practice and discipline for our thinking, it is certainly possible to learn pure, healthy, and vital thinking without it. Close parentheses. Seekers of knowledge 
must have the same goals for their actions as they have for their thinking. That is, their actions must not be disrupted by their personality, but must be able to obey the laws of eternal beauty and truth, accepting the direction these laws provide. Knowledge seekers who have begun something they recognize as right may not give up simply because what they are doing is not emotionally satisfying. On the other hand, they may not continue with something just because they enjoy it if they discover that it does not conform to the laws of eternal beauty and truth. In everyday life, people let their actions be determined by what is personally satisfying or fruitful. They impose the direction of their own personality on the course of world events. They are doing nothing to bring about the the truth laid out in the laws of the spiritual world. They are simply fulfilling their own arbitrary demands. We are acting in harmony with the spiritual world only when its laws are the only ones we obey. Actions proceeding only from our own personality supply no forces that could form a basis for spiritual knowledge. Seekers of knowledge cannot consider only what will yield fruit or lead to success for themselves. They must also consider what they have recognized as good. They must willingly submit to the strict law that requires them to renounce all personal arbitrariness and all fruits their actions may have for their own personality. Then they are walking the paths of the spiritual world and their whole being is permeated by its laws. They are freed from all sensory constraints. Their spirit being lifts free of its sensory trappings. This is how they spiritualize themselves, how they make progress toward the spiritual. We cannot question whether it does any good to resolve to obey only the laws of truth, when in fact we may be mistaken about what is true. Everything depends on our effort and our attitude. And even people who are mistaken but are aspiring to the truth possess a strength that will set them right, set them back on the right track. The very objection that we may be mistaken is in itself destructive disbelief and demonstrates a lack of trust in the power of truth. The point here is that instead of presuming to decide on our goals from our own self-serving point of view, we should submit selflessly to the Spirit and allow it to determine our direction for us. Self-serving human volition cannot dictate to the truth. Truth itself must become sovereign in us, filling our whole being and transforming us into a replica of spirit countries, eternal laws. We must imbue ourselves with these eternal laws in order to let them flow out into life. As seekers of knowledge, we must have our will as well as our thinking strictly under control. Then, in all humility and without presumption, we become messengers of the world of truth and beauty. We advance to become participants in the spiritual world and are lifted from one level of development to the next. But we cannot achieve living in the Spirit merely by being beholders of it. It has to be experienced. If the laws that are presented here are observed by seekers of knowledge, their inner experience in relation to the spiritual world will assume a completely new form. Instead of having significance only for their own personal life, it will develop into soul perceptions of the higher world. Feelings of pleasure and displeasure or joy and pain will grow into soul organs that transmit outer impressions selflessly like physical eyes and ears, which also do not exist for themselves alone. This is how knowledge seekers achieve the calm, and secure frame of mind required for research in the spiritual world. 
a great pleasure that once would have simply made them jump for joy, will now alert them to previously unnoticed aspects of their surroundings and will leave them at peace. Within this peace, features of the entities causing the pleasure will be revealed, and, on the other hand, pain will no longer simply fill the seekers with distress, but will also be able to inform them what qualities belong to the being causing the pain. Like eyes, which desire nothing for themselves, but selflessly show the physical person what direction to take, pleasure and pain will lead the soul safely on its way. This is the state of inner equanimity that we as seekers of knowledge must achieve. When pleasure and pain no longer expend themselves in creating turbulence in our inner life, they begin to function like eyes open to the supersensible world. It is not possible to use pleasure and pain as sources of information as long as we are dwelling in and on them. But once we have learned to live through them and no longer relate our feeling of identity to them, they become organs of perception we can use in order to see and to know. It is incorrect to think that a sage must become a dry, sober person incapable of experiencing pleasure or pain. For such a person, pleasure and pain still exist. But when he or she is investigating the spiritual world, these are present in metamorphosed form as, quote, eyes and ears, close quote. As long as our relationship to the world is a personal one, things show us only what connects them to our own personality. This, however, is merely their transient aspect. If we pull back from what is transient in ourselves and dwell with our capital I and our feeling of identity in what is lasting in us, our transient features are transformed and begin to convey the eternal aspects of things to us. This relationship between our own eternal aspect and what is eternal in other things is something seekers must be able to bring about deliberately. Before taking up any other exercises of the sort described here, <clears throat> and also while practicing them, we need to direct our attention to this immortal aspect. Whenever I observe a stone, plant, animal or person, I should be aware that something eternal is expressed there. I should be able to wonder about what is lasting in a transitory stone or a mortal person, what it is that will outlast their transient sense-perceptible manifestation. We must not imagine that if we turn our mind to the eternal like this, it will estrange us from immediate reality and destroy our ordinary capacity for observation and our feeling for everyday affairs. <clears throat> On the contrary, each little leaf and beetle will reveal countless mysteries when we look at it not only with our eyes, but also through our eyes with our spirit as well. Every glimmer or shade of color, every intonation, will remain vividly perceptible to our senses. Nothing will be lost, but infinite new life will be gained. People who do not know how to observe the smallest detail with their eyes will also never achieve spiritual vision, but only pale and bloodless thoughts. Everything depends on the attitude we acquire. How far we get will depend on our abilities. We only have to do what is right and let the rest develop on its own. To begin with, we must be content with turning our attention to what is lasting. This effort, in and of itself, will eventually allow us to recognize the eternal. We must wait until this is given to us. It will happen at the right moment if we wait and work. Soon after beginning such exercises, people notice major inner transformations. They learn to base their estimation of a thing's importance or lack of it exclusively on its recognized relationship to something lasting and eternal. They arrive at a new and different assessment of the world and feel differently 
related to their surroundings. What is transitory no longer attracts them for its own sake, as it used to, but becomes both part of and a metaphor for the eternal. They learn to love the eternal that lives in everything. It becomes as familiar to them as only the transitory aspect was before. This does not estrange them from life. On the contrary, they learn to value each thing in accordance with its true significance. Even life's trivial aspects do not leave such people untouched. But instead of getting lost in frivolities, spirit-seeking individuals see them in the right light and recognize their limited value. It would be a poor seeker of knowledge who would prefer to roam the cloudy heights and lose touch with life. True seers know how to use their elevated vantage point, clear overview, and strong sense of what is important to put each thing in its right place. The spiritually knowledgeable become able to stop obeying only the outer sense world's unpredictable influences that direct their intentions this way and that. Knowledge lets them see into the eternal nature of things. Through transforming their inner world, they have acquired the ability to perceive this eternal nature. The following thoughts acquire a particular significance for those who truly know. While acting out of themselves, such people are aware of acting out of the eternal nature of things, for they know that it is within them that outer things express their essence. Therefore, when the, no the knower's activity is directed by the eternal that lives within them, they are acting in accordance with the eternal order of the universe. They know that they are no longer simply being impelled by things, and are actively impelling things according to the laws implanted in the things themselves, laws which have also become the laws of their own being. This acting from within can only be an ideal to strive for. Reaching the goal still lies in the distant future, but the seeker of knowledge must have the will to see the way clearly. This is the will to freedom because freedom means acting from within, and only those who draw their motivation from the eternal can work from within. Any being who does not do this works out of reasons other than those inherent in things themselves, and thus works contrary to the order of the universe, which will triumph in the end. Ultimately, that is, this being cannot get its way and cannot become free. Arbitrary individual volition annihilates itself through the effect of its actions. <clears throat> Those who can work on their inner life in this way advance from stage to stage in spiritual knowledge. As a fruit of their exercises, specific insights into the supersensible world become accessible to their spiritual perception. They learn the sense in which facts about this world are to be taken and confirm them through direct experience. Having reached this stage, they are approached by something that can be encountered only along this path, in a way whose significance can only now become clear to them, quote, initiation, close quote, is bestowed on them through the great spiritual powers guiding the human race they become disciples of wisdom. The less we see this initiation as consisting of any outward human relationship, the more accurate the idea we have of it. It is possible only to hint at what is now happening to seekers of knowledge. They acquire a new home and become conscious inhabitants of the supersensible world. From now on, their spiritual insight flows from a higher source. The light of knowledge no longer shines toward them from outside. They themselves stand at this light's source. They see the riddles that the world presents in a new light. 
Now they converse not with things that have been given form by the Spirit, but with the formative Spirit itself. In moments of spiritual knowledge their life as personalities exists only to serve as a conscious metaphor of the eternal. They can no longer have any doubts about the Spirit, because doubt is possible only for someone whom things mislead with regard to the Spirit that prevails within them. And since the disciples of wisdom are able to converse with the Spirit itself, any false form in which they previously imagined the Spirit vanishes. Imagining the Spirit in a false form is superstition, and initiates are beyond superstition, because they know what the true form of the Spirit is. <clears throat> Freedom from the biases of personality, doubt and superstition characterize those who have traveled up the path of knowledge to the level of discipleship. But we must not confuse this uniting of personalities with the surrounding and all-encompassing spiritual life with the dissolution or destruction of personality in a universal spirit. That is not what happens in true personality development. Personality as such is maintained on entering into relationship with the spirit world. It is not overcome, but undergoes still higher development. If we need a metaphor of what happens when individual spirits unite with the universal spirit, we must not imagine different circles that coincide and become one, but many overlapping circles, each with a distinct shade of color. Although the circles overlap, each individual shade maintains its identity within the whole, and no circle loses any of the fullness of its individual strength. No further description of this path will be given here. To the extent that this is possible, it is done in Esoteric Science, titled Esoteric Science, which is a sequel to this volume. What has been said here about the path to spiritual knowledge can all too easily be misinterpreted as advocating the cultivation of moods and attitudes that entail turning away from the immediate, joyful, and active experience of life. It must be emphasized that the inner attitude that renders our soul fit for direct experience of spiritual reality cannot by extension be required of all the rest of our life. Those who investigate existence in the spirit can indeed achieve the soul distance from sensory reality necessary for their research without becoming strangers to the world on a general level. On the other hand, <clears throat> we must also realize that knowledge of the spiritual world that is acquired either through actually setting out on this path or through simply grasping spiritual scientific truths with our unprejudiced and healthy common sense, does lead to higher moral standards, to an understanding of sensory existence as it accords with the truth, to a secure confidence in life, and to mental health. The end of chapter 4, and that is the end of the book Theosophy by Rudolf Steiner. Subtitled, An Introduction to the Spiritual Processes in Human Life, and in the cosmos.